Welcome everybody at the Tribal Art Gallery in London. My name is Margot Neal. I'm the head of the Centre for Indigenous Knowledges at the National Museum of Australia. I'm also the senior curator and advisor to the Director on Indigenous Matters. But more importantly to this exhibition is that I'm the lead curator of this exhibition, which was co-curated with the, all the communities who are represented. I too am of Aboriginal and Irish descent from Victoria and New South Wales. And the people who are in this exhibition who are telling their stories about the Seven Sisters, they're the custodians of the story of the Seven Sisters at various sites, are Aboriginal people who live clearly across the three deserts that are covered by this exhibition. This is truly a groundbreaking exhibition with universal values. That's why it's been taken up in Europe, Asia, UK and the Northern America, because it now talks about how to care for country, how to sustain this country, this planet, in fact, ecologically, how to care for each other. And given that these stories have survived for 60 plus thousand years. It's a fair testament to how these stories have an inner knowledge and inner wisdom that is totally connected to the land and, of course, the celestial domain. So as the Seven Sisters star cluster and the Pleiades constellation rise every night, it sort of revives the story. And this is one of those truly universal stories because this is one of the sets of the star cluster and constellation that is visible in both the northern and southern hemispheres. Therefore, old ancient cultures in Britain, Ireland and France, Africa, everywhere had a seven sister story that would have a similar um, structure to this story. But I won't give it all away because you're going to go pop off to Plymouth and... Um, and see the exhibition for yourself with masses of people. Give yourself time to go back should you wish to, and I reckon you will, as many people did. The central story, like there's two things perhaps, and I may well explain them in the video, but one is that some lines can be visualised as corridors of knowledge or pathways of knowledge that crisscross the Australian continent in this case, in fact, crisscross the world, and these are sort of linking sites of significance, a natural form or feature, waterhole, cliff, river, tree, where various things occurred to form the creation of that site. And it's represented in an epic chase, like all great sagas, an epic chase where in this case where a man is pursuing seven sisters who he is wrongfully pursuing, which means he's going against the laws of the land and the laws of the people. So over millennia across the entire continent of Australia is recorded in the land. And it's those land sites that will tell you the stories. But of course, it's an oral culture. So you need to visit these sites or know about these sites in order to know what happened there and then transmit those values to the next generation. So that's a journey exhibition. So you'll be welcomed by the virtual elders to enter this place, which is mapping the song lines, which they're responsible for, across the three deserts. So the gallery becomes the three deserts. The paintings become the portals to each place where knowledge is divulged. So it's very much a journey exhibition in as much as the Seven Sisters journeyed in advance of the of the pursuit of the man who was a sorcerer who had human shape shifting capacities and it was a journey for us as the curators with the community to travel 7000 kilometers of song lines and therefore you as a visitor can also go on a journey and travel in the footsteps of both the Seven Sisters and the curators like me and the communities who put this exhibition together. So I'd like to thank you for being interested and thank the West Australian Museum for putting together the video that you will soon view. Um, and it's got great production values, it's a great venue. And as you see it in this video, we'll be 
different from how you'll see it at the box in Plymouth, which opens in uh, late October through to February. So go early so that you can go back. And I just hope to hear from you all and hope you enjoy it. And thanks very much for your time and attention. Hello, I'm Margot Neal from, from the National Museum of Australia. I'm the head of the Centre for Indigenous Knowledges and the senior Indigenous curator and indeed the lead curator of this Songlines exhibition, Songlines Tracking the Seven Sisters. And behind me are the other curators. We had a community curatorium and we worked together. The virtual elders behind me are the curators of country. And in combination with me at the museum, we were able to put this exhibition together and in fact map three deserts across the gallery floor and visitors will track the Seven Sisters song lines through the exhibition. The elders are basically saying a number of things. One, this is your exhibition, be included feel invited into our lounge room. This is Australia, you're Australians, we're Australians. And so we are here to teach you your stories. You cannot take root in this country as an Australian if you do not learn the stories of the country you live in. The last 250 years won't do it. We're going to teach you your stories from millennia. These same elders will pop up at various places, at various deserts, because only some people have the right to speak for certain parts, and they will guide you, as elders would, through this journey of life across the Seven Sisters song lines. This is the first uh, step into the gallery, and it's a transitional so zone between the institutional world of the museum into the desert the Aboriginal desert where this epic chase of the Seven Sisters takes place. The snake, which is a central metaphor for the entire show, representing something like the Garden of Eden where the snake is the temptation, the evil and the maleness that besets the Seven Sisters in their chase. You'll also get the rain of the desert, which then causes the desert to burst into bloom. This is an Aboriginal visual label of the Seven Sisters song lines as they travel from the west to the east and which represents partially what we were able to cover in the seven years of this project. This is one of the three deserts that are mapped across this gallery floor uh, where the Seven Sisters travelled. The first is, um, as you can see, is, is Mardu and that's sort of the upper half of Western Australia. And we have a couple of um, elders or traditional owners here uh, from the Māru country who are inviting you to come onto their country and learn that part of the Seven Sisters story that crossed their desert. This is a journey exhibition of an epic chase across the Australian continent. Wadi Nyiru, who's sitting over there in the corner, is wrongfully pursuing the Seven Sisters who are here. So these are the characters of this epic saga. The Seven Sisters are telling you that the marriage rules and the kinship rules are all really critical. And the elder sister here, is job is to care and look after the younger sisters and to teach them about not only where to find food, but to um, protect them against the advances of males that are not appropriate to their particular social system. So this is a sort of mnemonic, a memory system for learning about correct ways of behaviour and other cultural values and how to care for the land and what not to do. All this travel of all these women, eventually they tire, they get weary, they lay down and turn into big boulders and new boulders 
builders are created. And this, this is representing the cross-generational transfer of knowledge. We're still on the Pungal song line, the first song line that was um, covered in the Madu country. And this is just an epic work about how the um, very tired and weary seven sisters turned into big boulders and then created lots of little boulders to carry the story on. And these marks in here will show the body, markings on the body, as the sisters danced the story and warded off their uh, relentless pursuer. Now the interesting thing, it was here, in this area, in the Pungal area, that the um, that Eula, the man's name in this country, changes from country to country, um, got far too close for comfort and the sisters had to leave the land and fly across several hundred kilometres to the next song line. Um, because, you know, is in hot pursuit, too close. However, what, the, what that story really tells us is not that the, the sisters were looking to have wind in their hair and having a thrill. The, the information embedded in that is that do not try and walk this tract of country because there is no water and no resources to sustain you. So every element of the story that reads like a story, in fact, contains um, critical information for survival in the desert. This painting, epic painting, is called Yakalpa, Hunting Ground, done in 2013. It is just dense with ecological knowledge, ancestral knowledge, practical knowledge for surviving. So these eight elder women painted this to teach the younger rangers of the land to, to care for country and to read all the signs. And for example, just this part here, it's an encyclopedia, it's just a database of the dreaming if you like. But this part here is about um, the mosaic fire burning, you'll, read, you'll hear about these days in various books, but the dark parts for example uh, are, are the older burns where the white ash that you see in these parts still exist, the recent burns, and then after which that blows away, the green comes where the new shoots come, and this is the time you go hunting. The animals are here. This is so sand hills here, and then you move through water courses and into uh, even things like the township of this community, the oval. The Seven Sisters are up there in those circles. Here is the Bungor rock hole, native currants, bush plums, and um, other sorts of waterways and water courses. So you can go on, you could talk about this for a month. The, the intensity of knowledge that exists in here is limitless like an encyclopedia of knowledge of country and the rangers were taught by the old women about how to care for country and for food and water. But interestingly enough, this painting here, this rather film, here is a time lapse uh, of this being painted over you know, eight women, over 10 days, and you can sit here and watch it perhaps in 40 minutes from beginning to the end and you'll see the women moving on it but the significant factor about this is that although we all know Aboriginal painting is painted on canvas on the ground what you really the sense you get from this one is this is like this isn't about country this becomes country they live on it they sleep on it they walk on it dogs kids everyone runs across it and so it becomes it is like skin of country that's lifted from country with the sinews holding it to the floor. Paintings like this act as portals to place and this is Kalpa, as you can see written down there. This is where the Seven Sisters landed after they flew from the first song line. And at this place when they landed there were a bunch of men and they're all the fellows were saying, hey, we want you for our wives. Come, we need you for our wives. And the old lady who did this, um, um, Jakaya Bilba said, hey, we didn't come for you. We're not here for you. And they got sticks and they beat the men up. 
and they buzzed off and left them. We don't need you. And so there's all these other little stories about male and female relationships that run throughout. And then they flew to this place called um, the Bangor Rock Hole. And when they're about to land, they realise it's a men's place. And so they couldn't land there. They had to land further up above it on a hill. And it was up on this hill. So it's also teaching you through this exhibition about men's and women's sites and, and, and behaviours as well, as you can see in this place, a water hole. And it was interesting, it was at this time they said that this rock hole, just to conflate history, is when the day that John F. Kennedy died. So the women who, who were painting this were, as you can see here, historic, this is 1963, and the women telling this story are telling the story in the same breath as they're telling John F. Kennedy's story. That day that big president boss man died, was assassinated in America. So this fabulous conflation of the ancient, the historic and the contemporary, which is how the Aboriginal culture works. These are all the Canning Stock Root wells, so Aboriginal people sort of reclaimed it back. And in here, this is where, there's lots of narrative, this is where the um, people were formed out of the soft yellow clay of the ground uh, in both these. And here's an interesting one, because this is where um, Eula, as he was called here, got a bit close again. He stole the youngest sister and the older sisters hatched a plan. They said to him, we'll all come and sleep in your camp tonight, but you've got to go get us firewood. So he went off and got them firewood. And when they came back, he, they built a ladder and climbed up it and they were in a line in the sky out of reach so they would just trick him and kick the ladder and down he'd go and roll around then they start feeling sorry for him oh that poor fella you know but too bad we're out of here so it's you know there's a lot of and there's in that particular country you will see all the signs of that activity and that's how they know the story by reading the signs in the country the ladder and the rock one of the um, really important reasons that this exhibition came out of a desire for Aboriginal people to say the song lines because the young people were not hanging out in the bush anymore. They're too busy into, you know, this stuff, uh, all the new technologies. So we had to sort of make culture cool. So there's a lot of multimedia in here. This particular one was done by a young Māru man called Curtis Taylor. If you want to be a filmmaker, an artist or a story writer, you have to go back to country, you have to listen to the elders, you have to get the stories, you have to learn the protocols of who has the right to speak for what. So in this case, of course, this is his film interpretation of the Seven Sisters from his country, which he, and you can see on the label, he acknowledges the, the authority of the elders who told him that story. This is the last work of the Maru country, and now we're moving um, eastward towards the APY lands, Anangul Pitanjara Yakatajara lands. That's the language groups from there. Because every desert you have to have the rightful traditional custodian talk to you and invite you to be part of her country. This artist, Yarachi Young, is from an area just below the tri-state border and like all Aboriginal people she gets her dreaming stories from both sides of the family. From her father's side she has a honey ant story and from her mother's side she's an inheritor of the Seven Sisters story. And what this painting shows is a very original rendition of how the, you are an inheritor of many song lines. You see how they all wave and transect and they're dynamic and alive and, um, and keep on living. So Willinga um, Cave Hill is located in South Australia just below the tri-state border and as far as we know it is the only Seven Sisters rock art site in Australia and um, the dome, we have this fabulous dome which you lie under and you can be immersed in the Seven Sisters story on the rock and transported to that site and the elder who is the traditional owner of that site, responsible for it, 
uh, is called Stanley Douglas, who is pictured um, here with his brother, who's a traditional custodian, and the photos are taken by his daughter. And there's also a monitor that where you basically replicate, if you go into any secret or special or significant site, you need to get permission from the elders. And so this monitor is replicating this getting permission from the elders to go in here. In this dome now you'll see a painting from the APY lands where Cave Hill is and it, would, it described how these are journey sites of the Seven Sisters and now we're moving into another one which is in what we call the NPY lands and it's here that the sister, one of the sisters were harmed by what in Nuru. You see the sisters there? There and then you'll see Wadi Nuru where there's a sea. Oh, there's a snake. So, what he used to do is shape shift into edible foods or desirable trees. And so he came out of that hole. They knew he was in there. He's good tucker. They dug him up and they wanted to eat him, but he acted strangely. And the elder sister, who's the smartest one, said, No, 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 he's tricking us. So, they threw him up into the sky, as you will see. So it's full of story. All of the symbols reveal different parts of the Seven Sisters story. They found the snake again at, at Kuluru, at another place. They dug him up, and for whatever reason, they ate him. Cooked, that's an oven, bush oven. Cooked him, and they were sick for three days and all of these marks around here are them staggering around for three days. So the lesson is that is, you know, beware of what you eat. There's only some things that are edible and other things that are not. And eventually they uh, again throw the snake up into the sky and after a certain period of time, after all this chase for so long, they tire and they themselves disappear into the sky which is in this painting now. There they are. So they escape to the sky. They become the Seven Sisters star cluster. And the snake, who's the pursuer, becomes Orion, the constellation. And he continues so in the night sky to chase the sisters. So this is a piece of um, country in the APY lands which is below the tri-state border in the top of South Australia. Clearly very dry area and, and hot um, and the women had been in, you know, being chased all day, finally found a water hole, going to refresh and this is this one here called Widabula. so it's like it's a map. And, and he, they spotted him on the horizon had nowhere else to go, so dived below the water and travelled on the subterranean waterways or arterial waterways. And then in the meantime, he was over here searching for them and he was creating all sorts of devious tracks to, to send them to food. This is all different foods, his foods. Um, and he was creating it so that when they surfaced, they would follow his tracks and he would catch them again. Now, we've just been to Cave Hill, which is here. That's what he knew there. There's the hill which has a Seven Sisters um, rock art on, and they ran into that cave and he thought he had them. There's no way out, right? So he got extremely excited and a part of his body, uh, which they call his mulpa, got very excited, was, got so impatient, it chose not to wait for the man who actually wanted to go and introduce himself properly, but this lust side of him took over. It detached from his body, wended its way into the cave, and the women were gone because there's an opening at the back of the cave. And so his mulpa, snaked its way so-called under the ground to another site where the, the older sister was harmed. So this has got many more um, 
many more details in it. Each marking has a component of the story. This is the Wadi Nuru room, and here's the pursuer that is named APY Lands. And we created a, this room to acknowledge the role of the men in this story. Because it's called the Seven Sisters story, there's an assumption that it's only a women's story. But in Aboriginal society, um, there are always different but complementary roles, otherwise you wouldn't survive for millennia if, there, if people didn't work together. And it's very gender-specific roles. And the reason the room is painted red is to bring on that sense of passion, danger, fear, and all those other elements of the great chase, this, this saga of the male chasing the females across the land. This snake installation represents the menace or the risk or the temptation, which as we know exists in all civilizations, have the serpent or the snake as part of the story, um, and the maleness. And it also recurs from the very beginning of this exhibition all through the snake as a recurring motive. And of course you then have the other representation of the male's role, which is the hunting, which, and so we have a selection, an installation of spears here that are beautifully organised to create that sense of shimmer or vibration, which is also part of the power of the male of the spear. And up here we have um, the two Woomeras <coughs> flying off as they are to deal with the flight of the spear for the hunt. And here's the most direct representation of what in Europe. This is a very suggestive shape in the context of the sort of sexual pursuit, but it is described as him, what in Europe, with a red headband. And similarly, these are really important shields owned by one of the senior custodians. This projection is on the floor for a number of reasons, but mainly to show people how Aboriginal people sit around and actually make what we call punul, which is hot poker work. And you can see the lady here heating up the wire and burning the shapes in. And the, this other fella is sawing the shapes so, to make the snake symbol. But a lot of Aboriginal work is done as a con community collaborative and stories are shared. But in the bigger picture of this exhibition, all Aboriginal knowledges are embodied knowledge systems, right? It's a non-text-based society, traditionally. So as you walk through this show, you'll find you have to walk, lie on your back and look up, and then you've got to come in here and you look down, and then you walk along and look across, then you look up and you look at the top of the plinth. So the whole way through, you are using your body to learn um, information in the way Aboriginal people traditionally walked across country and learned from looking at the tracks, at the skies, inside the caves and various other things. So it's very much part of imparting the idea of an embodied knowledge system written in the land. If the Red Room is the male, the room that acknowledges the male role in the Seven Sister stories, this Blue Room would acknowledge the female's role in this um, teaching, nurturing part of the story. Now, uh, Alison Millica Carroll from Ernabella one day said to her granddaughter, hey, go get me your monka monka leaves. And they were duh. So they realised that the young people didn't have the knowledge, they didn't have the language name. So they said, you know, who are a group of women that work together in our culture who know about their country and the plants and the animals around them and use this knowledge as they travel around and protect and look after country? Seven Sisters, of course. So they taught all the young people through the Seven Sisters story. Seven pots for seven sisters, and there's Wadi Nuro lurking as usual over there, not far from sight. So each of these pots represents a transformation, the shape shifter made in order to lure the women to him. So here you've got the honey ant, he turned into that, he turned into the bush fig, a bush tomato, um, this is a witchetty grub, and the uh, water. And this is the design, the senior woman 
has taught them that you make on your body, body art for ceremony to dance to this story. This is another visualisation of the Seven Sisters travels around the APY lands and it's fa it, it, being circular is another recurring motive here and of course it's very much like the thinking but if you look up there you see the Seven Sisters and the circles at the top and the journey lines and then there's a circle over here which is the water hole called Widabula that they dove into when he got too close and travelled the subterranean waterways. And as they travelled, of course, they, these, uh, they found various plants and things to eat. And these are called amunca leaves, which are um, a herb, a special medicinal herb. And then you'll see on the annotation beside it that there are lots of other little things. There. There's little rock holes where they would have had to drink on the way. Here's more amunca leaves. And then as they traveled around here, they got to that place called Cave Hill. That's where the sorcerer, the shapeshifter, realized for the first time why the women were running. He looked down at the, his feet footprints, and there's only three toes and five toes. And then he realized he wasn't a man, he was a sorcerer and he was horrified because he couldn't work out why they kept running away he thought he was a man and realised he was a sorcerer. And so he had this ambivalent, you know, self moment of great self-realisation at, at Cave Hill, which is actually depicted um, in a very tiny spot up here. Um, so there's a range of, this is still part of the journey and the running that, that went on and various bush plants and then you get up again back to basically where they started. So this is just a legend to a journey around country of the Seven Sisters. This work by Ninica Lewis from Erna Ballet is really interesting. It's actually hot poker work. So all these brown outlines that you see here are done with the hot wire and the fire we would have seen earlier on board. So these aren't canvases. And this is quite a narrative, which is almost a summary narrative for the subsequent paintings that follow on this wall, which are also what we call Walker boards. So here's the man, it's actually pictured here, chasing the seven sisters, and they dive into this Witabula pool, which we heard about before, and then they travel under the waters and come up here at Iroa Boa, but it has lots of other parts of the story. This is where the sisters turned into trees um, to hide from the, from the man, Desert Oaks. This is where they were camping on a salt pan and you can see them. they turned into boulders here. Uh, again, we saw it in an earlier painting, and this is him observing them, and then you can see this constant chase, this constant running, and, and here they're sort of, you know, eating, sitting around a campfire, camping for the night, and that's their seated shapes and their full coolamans with water. So this is a salt pan around the area of, um, in the APY lands. That's him. That's what in Nehru. So here's what in Nehru. This is an ancient performance that no one else is allowed to touch. Primary knowledge is imparted through this performance. He's acting as what in Nehru, and he's hitting the ground to create vibrations, to frighten them, to flush them out. And um, it's a performance that was done by the lake in Canberra. And all the moves and the chanting are ancient chants that they remembered the more they rehearsed over the many years. What's interesting about this is a senior, mostly senior traditional custodians, and these ladies, in fact, many of them are in wheelchairs, but they had the power of the spirit, if you like, to actually dance um, and move to this, to the Seven Sisters, so they would feel very allied with the power of the sisters, which would enable them to um, do this. And even though we had a, um, you know, Wesley Oak, Enoch, Wesley Enoch, who was the creative director, he was not allowed to ever to make any choreographic changes whatsoever because this is the primary mode of transmission of knowledge in traditional Abol Aboriginal culture, not the paintings, but these performances. 
Now we're in the third desert uh, of the Seven Sisters journey and this is the Narrandari lands which is just over the Western Australian border um, on the, the eastern side of Western Australia, not that far actually from Uluru. And it's here the Seven Sisters sort of had their final episode in the part of the story that we're telling. There's, obviously it covers the whole continent. But here it's in a place called, mostly a place called Kuluru. And Kuluru is known by that site there. That is Kuluru. That is what in Uru, peering at the sisters relentlessly. And all of these paintings will tell various parts of that episode, including the carpet snake that was had to be retrieved and thrown into the sky uh, and here the sisters actually fly into the sky after consuming him and getting very ill um, and this particular painting was done exactly at the base of this escarpment uh, which has a, a lot of detail about the Kurala story which as you can see here means two eyes, that is what in you looking. And in the end, of course, at the end of this story place, they, sisters, take to the sky. This is where the sisters fly away and become the Pleiades star cluster. After they have dropped all their earthly possessions as they are you're departing there, the terrestrial existence, and going to a, to a more celestial life, and in fact an ancestral life uh, in the solar system. Here we are in the NPY lands, and there's a song line that you'll see running across here, uh, and you can follow this in the tracks of the Seven Sisters. So Wadi Nuru heard, he was sitting in the sand, squatting down, having a, a, relieving himself and the sisters were over this side. He heard them giggling and laughing and therefore the chase began again over in, in the Nanandere lands, which this is where the sisters ran and hid. Uh, this is more, uh, more pictorial or more um, detailed. Here he is sitting here around the fire with his weapons and the seven sisters are here. He's spying on them here. And these are various caves and sites. He's spying on them, so it's more depicting. And the sisters then hide into a cave. And in order to ward him off, sometimes they would dance the story as a sort of a power thing. And these are all the dance lines in the sand as they dance. When they did find the snake, um, which they thought was meat, cooked it, ate it in this camp of oven in the sand, got very sick, he nearly got them, which is his idea of course to consume, they will enter, enter them and here they got very ill, danced around and in the end they threw the snake off, they went to this place called Kuluru, hid in the ant bed. And um, then enough's enough and off, you can see them flying off here uh, into the skies for the last time. This painting is really important because this painting was done 20 years earlier by the artists who did these by their aunties and their mothers and their grandmothers. And so when the women come here, they, this is not a story and this is not a canvas. They touch each part where their mothers and grandmothers painted it and they weep and they, you know, they are actually in country. They transport themselves to country and become part of that country and the story and their um, relatives. This section is the last songs. Um, here at Tracky, the Seven Sisters ends, but the story itself never ends. The sisters and their pursuer continue to play out their journey in the features of the land each night in the Pleiades star cluster and the Orion constellation. So here you have like Jeopardy, the bold gestures, the passion, the lust, the wit, the chase, 
epitomised in this dynamic, epic painting of Chapati Bates. You will see diminishes as her body is more fragile, her hands get wobbly, and her end of her life is nigh. And you will see the strength of that bold gesture diminish around until you get to this quite ethereal, non-defined image. When she moves into the aged care home, you see these senior custodians are sort of losing grip, if you like, with the physical, becomes more soulful, and these are sort of the marks of the Jukupa now, the marks of the dreaming, Jukupa marks of the seven sisters so now instead of yelling out the dreaming of the seven sisters they are now whispering the jukupa and their paintings they paint their eyesight's failing and their capacity to physically handle their brushes but they can't stop doing the marks of the dreaming so as they lose touch with their capacity um, what remains is the essence of the Jukupa, the essence of the dreaming of the Seven Sisters, and they just make marks, back to mark mating, on pillow slips, on TV screens, on coffee mugs, tables, they just, bits of cardboard that you see here, which are the same kind of symbols you see in the, the bigger composed paintings, until it totally fragments and becomes um, so consistent with their movement from the physical to the cosmological into the ancestral domain to join the seven sisters. And this one and nursing home where they are is sited specifically on the intersections of the seven sisters long song lines, which are so potent there that on certain days people must avoid that area because the sisters are not happy. As the senior custodians of the seven sisters themselves aged and lost contact with the physical part of their existence, they too, like the seven sisters in the saga, rose into another realm, into the ancestral realm to then join the story of the seven sisters. The Art Centre Hub is a very integral part of this exhibition because this is the place in all communities where all of the actual cultural activities occur. This is where the paintings happen, where they are sold to the outside world, where Aboriginal people are able to earn their own living independently. Um, they can practice their dreaming stories, they can share the stories. This is where education occurs master classes, you can see the state of the painting um, cushions that, that come from centres, the sinks look like that, they're a hive of industry, so it's education, public programs, yarning, economy, and this is it's like 50 or more of these art centre hubs exist across the three deserts that we've been traversing today.